contribution. So we're going to jump into the book of Luke, and then that goes right into the book of Acts as part two. They both begin with to dear the uh, Theophilus, and so we're going to go through Luke and try to hit the high points through that. So when we look at Luke, we see Jesus is coming to keep the covenant and establish the new covenant. And as you know, he is going to be displayed as someone who serves the common people and reaches to them, even though the religious leaders wind up rejecting him. And as we go through this book of Luke, we'll take the first three chapters and look at the setting. And Luke gives us things that aren't in any other gospel. 60% of Luke is found in Mark. Matthew was written first, then Mark, then Luke, and then John later on, okay? And so Luke is, is, is the only person who ever wrote books. Luke, and, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts, and he's Greek. All the other authors are Jewish. So this is the first Greek author of Scripture, okay? And his outlook and use is going to be of Greek to the Gentiles, and where did Luke get most of his information from? The Apostle Paul, right? So he was with Paul a lot, but he did research with Philip and other people. He was not an eyewitness. He wasn't there. He didn't know Jesus, but he came later on. And then he wants to compile this gospel, giving you information. Now, before we get into Luke, the question is, what were the 400 years of silence? This is when the Old Testament ends and the New Testament begins. And when the New Testament begins, who's the big prophet that shows up to start out with the New Testament? John the Baptist. Very good. So these 400 silent years went through the Babylonian, the Persians, the Greeks, and then finally the Roman rule. And all of this period, the Jewish people are now out of favor with God because they've rebelled against them and he's asking them to repent. And so there's a message for this beginning of the Babylonian captivity is called the time of the Gentiles, okay? So we're still in the time of the Gentiles. So we're going to ask you, what is the time of the Gentiles? And here's Galatians telling you about that. It says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And so here's the beginning summary of Jesus' coming on the scene and before him, John the Baptist. Now, Henry Ironside wrote a nice blip on the 400 silent years, if you're interested, because not many people really study those or don't understand what they're all about. Now, if you ask yourself, how does the Old Testament end, what do you think it ends with? Usually it ends with a curse, because if you don't keep this, this is going to happen and it happens, right? And then how does the New Testament end? Well, it ends with a blessing. So let's see how that's true. So in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and notice how Malachi stops, and then Luke begins, and guess who they're talking about? John the Baptist. So he goes, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. It ends with a curse. How does the New Testament end? Well, it ends with a blessing. It says in the last verses of Revelation, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David because the Davidic line is all through this. The bright and morning star and the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So there's an invitation, come and taste. 
For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecies of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book, and anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. So what does it end with? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, I am coming and I'm coming quickly. So when we think about this 400 to 450 years of silence, the Old Testament canon was closed about 400 BC when Ezra was around and Malachi's the last book. The New Testament opens at about 50 AD, so there's nothing written down for 450 years, and then John the Baptist appears on the scene, and he broke the silence. Now, what is the Apocrypha? Have any of you known what the Apocrypha is? Very good. So the Apocrypha, as you said, Donna, is a group of books that were written between the close of the Old Testament and beginning of the New, and they were not authenticated, they're not canonized, they're not in Scripture. However, some religious groups and denominations still hold these true. The word Apocrypha means hidden or secret, and it's a group of books that we mentioned occurred during that period of time. So who accepts the Apocrypha and puts it in a Bible? The Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and Coptic. What are the books? Well, I'm not going to read them, but there's all these books that have been written that you can actually read them for history, but you cannot rely on them for scriptural authenticity as God's word. But there is a lot of historical truth in these books. And the books that are most interesting historically are First and Second Maccabees. And so that's different than the books that were written after the New Testament was accepted. And then all these other books start showing up with different names and calling them Gospels. We only know Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but the non-canical books have very different names and the church never accepted those. So let me give you a history lesson so we can understand what's going on. First of all, uh, Alexander the Great conquered the Medo-Persians. When he died, his four generals divided his kingdom. The two generals that were in charge of the Holy Land, which fought over it tooth and nail, is recorded in the book of Daniel, and it was Ptolemy, which is Egypt, and it was the Seleucid dynasty, which is Syria, and that whole area. And then what happened was, after the boot of this group constantly oppressing the Jews, there was a priest that emerged, and it became the name the Maccabean priesthood. And so the Maccabeans battled until Rome took control uh, all the way into, say, 74 B.C. So here's the Maccabean conquest occurring during this period of time, and they defeated the weakening Seleucid Empire and took over the land, and then the Romans came on board. So if you read about 1 Maccabees, it will tell you about this battle that was going on, and you'll learn names that may be helpful for you. One of the names is called the Hasmonean Dynasty, and I'm going to summarize this to you real quickly. What happened was Antiochus Epiphany, who was the pre-Antichrist figure in the book of Daniel, has tried to Hellenize and make the Jewish people Greek, and he shuts down uh, doing circumcision and worshiping at the temple. And when he asks for something to be done, an aged priest named Matthias refuses to follow him and revolts. And then his son Judas, the Maccabean, who was nicknamed the Hammer, 
you can imagine that warrior name. He has a bunch of battles and then defeats the Seleucids, and then the Jews are in more and more control, and then his sons are continuing this dynasty. They both die in the revolt. So this is called the Maccabean Revolt, and it occurs during Antiochus Epiphany's period of time, and it was because the priest Matthias refused to obey, and a revolt started. And here is that priest who gives birth to all these and they call him the Hasmonean family, and it reigns over the area of Judah. Now remember, this is all prophesied in Daniel. So a lot of people say that Daniel, people that aren't believers, say there's no way Daniel could have wrote about all this detail hundred years before, so it had to have been written after it occurred. So Daniel is so specific He tells you all about what's happening in this area, and it's in chapter 11. And he talks about Ptolemy and Antiochus and all of that stuff, which is historical truth. And Antiochus IV is the one, Epiphanes, who is the embodiment of the Antichrist, who begins the desolation, the, um, the desolation of the temple, which is what? He sacrifices a pig on the altar and desecrates it. And and it was looking towards the future Antichrist that will also desecrate the temple and want to be worshipped. So historically, we had the Persians, the Greeks. Then we had the Maccabean period where the Jews wrest control. And now the Romans have everything under control and enter into John the Baptist. So as we look at this, the times of the Gentiles began when they were taken captive to Babylon. It kept through Persia, Greece, Rome 1. And then what is Rome 2? What's Rome 2? The tribulation period when the revised Roman Empire comes up. So we're right there after the cross before Rome 2. And then the time of the Gentiles will be over, and then the Jews will be back in control with Jesus as the Messiah, and that will be called what? The millennial reign of Christ, right? So that's where we are historically. So what is the time of the Gentiles? Well, if you read about Daniel, again, that's all mentioned in there. And I want to quote what Luke says. He says in Luke 21, 24, and 27, he goes, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until when? The time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And what is the end of the time of the Gentiles? And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So uh, we mentioned about Daniel saying that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and the head of gold was who? Babylon. And then the silver right and left arm was who? Medo-Persia, two kingdoms. And the bronze was who? Alexander the Great, the Greeks. And why was he represented as a leopard with wings? Because he's fast, he conquered fast, didn't touch the ground, like a leopard. And remember, the lion was Babylon, the bear was Medo-Persia, and then the ram that kills the bear, who's the ram? Alexander the Great. Why does the leopard have four heads? Because there's four generals going to take over after him. And then we have iron, who's noted as the kingdom of iron, rule with a fist of iron, is Rome. And why is the feet iron and clay? Because that is a weak kingdom of ten toes, and that's the future kingdom. And what annihilates this whole statue of kingdoms? A rock, and what was that rock? Jesus Christ, and it was cut out of a mountain without hands, and he annihilates it, okay? So what destroys all of these? It's the rock, Jesus Christ, 
second coming, right? So we have all those in the background. So what happens to the Jews during and after the time of the Gentiles? Are they no longer going to be having any relationship with God? What happens to them? Well, God is using the time of the Gentiles to do what? Cause them to become jealous and say, hey, I want back in here, right? So they're not going to be lost forever. And so Paul talks about this in Romans, and he says, through the Jews' rejection of the gospel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. The riches of God was first extended to the Jews, and after their rejection of the gospel, it's sent to the Jew Gentiles. And watch this, it says, to provoke the Jews that some of them might be saved. And then the time of the Gentiles, when is that used in the Bible? Well, we just read Luke 21 about Jerusalem will be trodden of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Acts says, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you Jews, since you thrust it aside, judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. And then Paul writes in Romans, some of the branches, Jews, were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, Gentiles were grafted in among them. You have become sharer of the root and the fatness of the olive tree with them. And then in Romans, he says, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery. What's the mystery? A partial hardening has come to Israel when? Until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And when will the last Gentile come in? right before Christ comes, right? And so God knows when the last Gentile will come in. Now, I looked up the website and I thought this was a very important point that I'm gonna give you word for word from Dr. Bayless because it was very apropos. And, it is, and, and by the way, Pastor Ken, if you hear his messages, he pumps this point constantly, okay? And what is the point? The point is, what is a wrong way to view obedience to God commandment and what is a right way to view them? So what is the wrong way to view obedience to God's commandments? Earn your way to heaven. Thank you. That's me before I came to know Christ. I came from a Catholic background and I was trying to earn my way to heaven. And when I ask people all the time, uh, what do you think it takes to go to heaven, or are you going to heaven, and if so, how are you going to get there? The overwhelming theme is, I'm a pretty good person, and what am I comparing myself to? Someone who is not as good as me, and you think I could find someone who isn't as good as me somewhere? There's someone who's not as good as me, and where does God draw the line? Well, right about here, because I just made it, so I'm sort of right at the line. So that's how I was thinking and many others. And so that's the wrong way to think about it. And then here's the right way to think about it. So let me emphasize this point. It says, obedience does not require the practical keeping of the commandments for God's blessing. And Pastor Ken harps on this all the time. Even as a saved person, I want God to love me more, so I'm going to keep trying to earn my favor with God. That's not the right it's hard for your brain to accept that because we don't think that way. This is how God's word says. To say that one does this for God's blessing is to actually follow what the Pharisees affirm. You know, Jesus castigated the Pharisees' belief, and that was the, their belief. So the right view of obedience is the obedience is to imitate God through the direction indicated in the revelation, which includes commandments, but one is to recognize that one imitates, here it is, this is the key, a heart love for God and not to earn merit. So when you are obeying your parents, there's a tendency for you to do it because you're trying to get their favor and they like you and they give you favorable responses. That's not the reason, it's because of the love because he first loved us, okay? So that's hard for us to grab a hold of. Thus, obedience is the heart desire to follow God's direction through his imputed 
mercy and standing as a son. So that's the key point. Kessed, imputed mercy, God's mercy. And it says, one would go to the sacrifices to receive the mercies of God for the errors in achieving the law. It was longing for the mercy of God that demonstrated their identity with his character, the very character of mercy. So people were offering sacrifices and God would say, I'm accepting this one, but I'm not accepting that one. And what's the classic story in the Bible that illustrates God accepted that guy's sacrifice and didn't accept that guy? Cain and Abel, right? Because Cain offered what he wanted to, which was ultimately his own self point, and Abel offered a blood sacrifice. And then the New Testament, what's the parable? The religious Pharisee says, looks up to heaven, says, thank you, God, I'm not like that wretched guy over there. I do this, 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 and my self-righteousness was not accepted. The tax collector beats his breast, sits in the corner, and says, God, please forgive me, I'm a wretched sinner. And Jesus said, that man went away justified and not the other one. And it's that point is where it all comes in. So, as I said, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector defines the terms righteous and humble. They're a contrast between those who perceive whether the effect of the law results in their own righteousness or in their own condemnation. So you're keeping the law or trying to. Actually, the goal is to condemn you to show you cannot keep the law. You need God and the Holy Spirit to help you to fulfill the law by that relationship of love, okay? Now, it doesn't mean you can go out and do everything you want and not follow the commandments as we're learning all about that because that's the opposite of a love for God, doing it out of love. So the theme of Luke is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Thus, the law condemned man fully and anticipated Jesus as the one who would provide mercy like the sacrifices of the Old Testament. It looked towards the future. This is seen as Jesus relates his first coming to the Old Testament, the lost son, a reflection of Deuteronomy, Lazarus and the rich man, the road to Emmaus. What happened on the road to Emmaus? Jesus opened their eyes of what? The Old Testament scriptures that said the Messiah must suffer, die, and rise again, and here's the fulfillment. They didn't get it, but on the road to Emmaus, he explained it all to them, and then he sends the apostles out. Now, both Luke and Acts begins with, dear Theophilus. What does Theophilus mean? Here's your Greek uh, lesson today. Theo, Phyllis, love, God lover, Theophilus, okay? And he says, most excellent, so he must be some high figure, and he's writing this out so Theophilus can understand, either as a believer or to convert him. Now, what do we know about Luke from Bible references? There's three verses that give us who Luke is, but what do you know about Luke? How is he different than Matthew, Mark, and John? What can you tell me about Luke? He's a physician. Now, physician in those days were probably pretty quacky, and how do we know that? Because the woman with the hemorrhage sought money for 15 years and just became poor and got no better. Now, uh, they didn't really have any knowledge back then, but so Luke is not going to give you these big words like doctors like to speak and all those different parts of the body and all the diseases, but he is sophisticated and he's going to tell you about stuff. So Luke is a doctor. He's well educated. He wrote and polished Greek. He has wide vocabulary. He is not a Jew, he's a Greek. He's the only gospel writer who doesn't meet Jesus personally. He becomes a believer and companion of Paul as long as 20 years after Jesus died and been raised. And when you look through the book of Acts and it's talking with about Paul, how do you know Luke is with him? Because he starts using the word we and us. Then you know Luke shows up right about that time, okay? So uh, if you go to the ancient writers, Eusebius and Jerome, 
identified Luke as coming from Antioch, which may explain why much of the book of Acts centers on Antioch, where they were first called, what? Christians, right? So Luke was a frequent companion of Paul, at least from the Macedonian vision on, right up to Paul's martyrdom, and you can see that in those verses there. So how did Luke portray Jesus? Luke portrays Jesus as the son of man rejected by Israel and then offered to the world. Luke repeatedly relates accounts of Gentile Samaritans and outcasts who found grace in Jesus' eyes, which is exactly the emphasis we would expect from a close companion of the apostle of the Gentiles. And who's the apostle of the Gentiles? Paul. Thank you. So what is the key verse and point of the Gospel of Luke? And the answer is verse 10 of chapter 19. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, as we get into chapters 1 through 3, which I recommend you read, we're going to see five visits from heaven that's only in Luke and not in any of the other Gospels, okay? So the first visit is this one, and which visit are we looking at for you who can see an artistic painting and tell exactly in the Bible where we're at? That is correct. There's only two angels named, and one of them is not Raphael. Okay? So what are the two? Michael and Gabriel. What does Gabriel usually show up in the Bible doing? Announcing, what does Michael show up doing as a warrior? And he's the main angel who fights for who? Israel. Okay, thank you. So here it is. The angel said to him, to Zechariah, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You shall call his name John, John the Baptist. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Drinking neither wine nor strong drink sounds like what vow is taken? The Nazarite vow. And who are famous people who had a Nazarite vow? Samson. And what happened to Samson when he disobeyed his Nazarite vow? He got major problems. He got blinded and ultimately died because he got his hair cut off and a Nazarite's not supposed to cut their hair off. Plus, he defiled himself by doing what? He messed with dead animals like a dead lion, okay? He did a lot of stuff that wasn't in keeping with the Nazarite vow. John the Baptist ate what? Honey and locust. Who else in the Old Testament did that? and walked around in a camel's hair outfit. Elijah, okay, so there's a lot of correlation there. So um, if we go on, it says, um, he will turn, listen to this, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That's exactly what he did. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. What's he gonna do? He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and do what? Make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So when a king would come, what would they do before the king comes down the road? They would herald, hey, the king is coming, and they would clean up all the debris and clean it up and prepare the way for the king. So this is what he's doing. Now, how did Zechariah respond to the angel, and what was the outcome? disbelief and he couldn't talk okay and there he is he's supposed to come out and he's supposed to give them a big speech that blesses and thanks god and he can't say a word okay so how does when did god open zacharias mouth to teach to speak what did he say he goes His name is John, and then bingo, and then what's he do? He goes into a big speech blessing God, right? So here is John the Baptist, and all of a sudden they said, 
why aren't you calling his name Zechariah after his father? And they go, let's go ask Zechariah. And Zechariah writes, his name is John, and then his mouth is open, okay? So why was he unable to speak for nine months? Because you said it. The same thing Jesus said, why could he not do great miracles in his own hometown? Because he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. What was the second appearance? Mary. So this is Gabriel appearing to Mary, okay? The same Gabriel who appeared to Zechariah. It says, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth the Son, shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. What was Mary's response to the angel, and what was the outcome? The opposite of Zechariah's response. But she also asked a question, but she was not made dumb or deaf. So what was the response? How can this be, right? And she says it because not of unbelief, but she goes, she believed and trusted God's word. She knew God's word. She surrendered completely her will. She experienced the grace of God she was used by the Holy Spirit, and she was accomplished God's will perfectly. So when did Jesus and John the Baptist first meet? Right. They first met right here. And this is when um, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and they meet, and he jumps with excitement, and Mary says, my soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. And then Elizabeth said the baby jumped and they met for the first time right there. Then Mary sings a song of praise. It's similar to what song of praise in the Old Testament? Hannah. And what was Hannah's song of praise about having what? Samuel, Right? She couldn't have kids. She went to the priest, Eli, and Eli says, God will answer your prayer. So if you compare the song of Hannah and the song of Mary, Hannah prays, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies. I rejoice in your salvation. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. So Mary is not the source of grace. So you don't go to Mary to get grace, okay? Mary needs salvation just like everybody else. That's why she says, my spirit has rejoiced in who? God, my Savior, right? So it says, no one is holy like the Lord, for there's none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. That's Hannah, Mary. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Hannah. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Mary, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. They both are against the proud and their pro-humility. Hannah, the bowels of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Mary, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Hannah, those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Mary, he has filled the hungry with good things. Hannah, he will guard the feet of his saints. Mary, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Hannah, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Mary, he has put down the mighty from their thrones, and the rich he has sent away empty. Finally, Hannah, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Mary, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. So what was the difference between Zechariah and Mary's response to the angel? 
Zechariah says, how shall I know this? For I am old and my wife is advanced in years. That is a statement of disbelief. Mary says, how would this be since I have not known a man? I am a virgin. How is this going to happen? And then the angel answers Zechariah, I stand in the presence of God and you are not believing me, which means you're not believing God's word. So therefore you will be silent, unable to speak. Why? Because you did not believe my words. Angel says to Mary, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word, even though I don't understand it all. So Gabriel to Zacharias versus Gabriel to Mary, they both appear, one's in a holy place and one's in Nazareth, they're both afraid, Mary's confused, they both get an announcement, don't fear, your prayer is heard, you're found favor, you will have a son, you will have a son, one's John the Baptist, one's Jesus, they're both going to be great. No wine filled with the Spirit, Son of the Most High. Prepare for the King. He will be the King over Jacob. Affirmation, the source and nature of the message, and he's mute. And the affirmation to Mary is the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth affirms her, and so does God's Word. The third appearance, we're out of time. So I got three more to go. So come back next week, and we'll talk about which one this one is. There's going to be five of them, so we got through two, and then um, if you all stand...